Well, good evening. good evening. Appreciate your presence tonight. Um, I know that you could be in a lot of other places. I'm glad that you've chosen to be here with this, this spiritual family and dive into the Word of God uh, this evening together. Uh, troubled um, to hear uh, some of the things that have been going on the last few days, for lack of a better word. The Bible tells us, you know, we rejoice with those who rejoice. We, we grieve with those who grieve. And so uh, right now with some of the, uh, the loss of of the spiritual family and, and some of the difficulties that are going on, some of the challenges. I uh, just want to, you to know that uh, we, we grieve with you. A uh, lot, to, lot to rejoice about this, this year as well. And again, thank you for your presence here uh, tonight. When Jeremy contacted me about speaking here tonight, uh, he wanted me to speak on something related to being a multicultural church and how we respond to those challenges and how to grow as a diverse uh, church in an increasingly diverse world. And I mean that, the world has always been diverse, uh, but uh, what we are seeing is more of an internationalization of our world everywhere. Um, and this is something that, that I hope that we, we welcome in many ways. Let me tell you a little bit about Rockville. I, I don't claim to be an expert on this, this topic at all, uh, but I want to share with you some biblical insights tonight and hopefully some personal insights that uh, might help help you personally and as a church to respond to some of the opportunities that we have and in our increasingly global world that we live in. Uh, Rockville, Maryland is just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, and one of the first things that we noticed even before we started the work there was how diverse a place this was, uh, very international. Um, and not even in, just international, people that have come from other nations, people that have come from every corner of the United States. Uh, people that have our, our congregation there, just to give you a little flavor of, of who we are, about of about 120 people that I'm thinking of uh, right now that are part of our congregation. Uh, we have, I went through and looked at it, about 16, at least 16 different nations uh, where people have been born that are among the, that group. And that, that represents five different continents. We don't have anyone from Australia so far and no one from Antarctica. I, I doubt we're going to get someone from Antarctica. But uh, that, that's pretty diverse. Um, we have not only that, not only those who were born in the United States, we have people from southern states. Uh, we actually have some others from Georgia. We have some from Alabama, from Tennessee, from, from Louisiana, from Arkansas, from the Carolinas. Um, we have some from the Midwest, we have some from the West Coast, we have some from New England, New York, on up, on up even uh, beyond that. So it's, it, it's a wide range of people, at least in that sense, uh, of where they are from. And, and even among those people that were born in the United States, uh, we have some that are from European descent, we have some that are from African descent, we have some that are from Hispanic descent, we have some from Asian uh, descent. Uh, so it, it really is a mixture of a lot of different People. I have tried to be a student of cultures in my time there, and that's one of my first things I want to say tonight. Uh, if you want to really get to know people, uh, where they're at, where they come from, uh, and how to, how to reach them, and how to befriend them, and how to get close to them, and how to involve them, all these things are involved in who we are as a church. Uh, be a student. Uh, be a learner. And I don't mean just go get you a book on the history of this particular people group and some of their struggles. That can be helpful too. You know, you read about some of the history of where people have come from. Hey, that's helpful. I try to do that some too. The number one way that you're a student though is just being willing to approach people and to listen to them, to see where they're at, to see what their story is, to see where they're coming from. And it's going to make you a more well-rounded individual in, in how you see how really it's confirmed my faith of how universal that the gospel is and how it reaches everyone. And uh, among other things, and I'll, we'll talk about some of our differences tonight, but what I have seen more than anything is people are people. No matter what accent that they speak with, uh, no matter uh, how, how much they draw out their words, as many of us do, or how, how fast they may talk, or what other accent that they may have, no matter what their skin color, no matter where they come from, no matter what their cultural story is, people are people. We have the same basic human needs. Um, and that's, that really levels what we're looking at uh, tonight. And so tonight we're gonna, do, we're gonna do a couple of things. Uh, uh, the question really is how we as churches can respond to this increasingly international world. Um, this is not just in Rockville, Maryland. 
it's not just in the United States. You go pretty much anywhere in the world now, and it's not like it was 100 years ago. Uh, because of changes in information technology and, you know, how, how fast we can, we can find out what's going on from any corner of the globe instantaneously. You can pull your phone out right now and find that out. You can communicate with people that are around the globe within seconds or less, a fraction of a second that you can communicate with them. Um, and that's what's going on everywhere now. We, so we've got the changes in information technology. Um, we've got the changes in transportation technology. Isn't that wonderful? And I, I think of the old days where in order to get down here, I cannot imagine without either having an interstate system or uh, the ability to fly to be able to get down here and be able to spend time with, with our family uh, for a few days during the holiday season. Travel has become easier. That's a blessing. We need to be taking advantage of that in our world. So the, the ease of information, the ease of transportation, uh, and really changes in the job market. Markets. It's, it's a global market. You know, our economies are, are mixed up and some, sometimes jobs, and that's why a lot of people end up in Maryland. You know, jobs bring them there, even from other parts of the country or other parts of the world. And that's what we're seeing everywhere now. People are on the move. But this is not the first time in history that this has happened. I would say that the diversity that we're seeing in the international world that we're seeing now may be the, the most global that we have seen the world since maybe the first century time when Jesus came along. It's, a very, it's another very international period that we'll explore some tonight. Here's what we're going to do tonight. I want to first do an overview of some biblical principles about this, uh, about cultural diversity and why that's important and, and some of the challenges for the people of God. So uh, I hope you have your Bibles ready. We're going to look at some of that. And then after that, we're going to look at some practical ways. I want to give you seven at the end of this, some practical ways for you as an individual and for all of us as a church to be able to implement in our interactions with people that I think will help strengthen us so that we can respond to as our communities become more diverse, will our churches reflect that diversity? And will they even go above and beyond the kind of diversity that the world uh, is promoting right now? Can we be the shining light in this area? Now, this may not seem like a very Christmassy topic on Christmas evening, but uh, just since this is a day when the birth of Jesus is on the minds of a lot of people, I want you to do a quick thought experiment with me. I want you to think about Mary and Joseph, um, and I want you to think about their story from this perspective, just, just as a quick thought experiment. What do we have with Mary and Joseph? We have a young teenage mom who's pregnant, an Asian mom, Middle Eastern more specifically, and we have her about to bring a child into the, war, into the world, into a situation of poverty, it's going to be the son of a carpenter. And then almost as soon as this child is born, both the child and the parents are going to become refugees to Africa for a time, where they're going to be until they can be able to come back into their native Palestine as part of Asia. And they had to have to do all this all because there is an Edomite ruler by the name of Herod who wants to threaten the life of their child and he is someone who rules over these Jewish lands. He at least thinks he does. Really his authority comes from some people way over, some Italians that have conquered this whole area and they took it from Greece, who took it from the Persians who are in modern day Iran, who took it from the Babylonians who are modern day Iraq. There will be a quiz on that uh, at the end. So I hope you got all that. Now, th this is really just to show you an example of pretty much any story that you take out of the Bible. What do you see? It's an international story. There are interactions between people groups of all, all kinds, okay? So this is nothing new to the world. Uh, th this is part of the Bible story. This is part of what we have going on. Um, and so really, th th that's a large part of the whole story of the Bible. I want you to think about this tonight. The diversity is most pronounced in the early stages uh, in a place called uh, this valley of this plain area of, of Shinar uh, where this group of people gather and we read of this in Genesis chapter 11 and we read that God had commanded to spread out across the earth right this we told Adam and Eve at the very beginning he said be fruitful and multiply and then he said uh, fill the earth and subdue it okay so that's part of their mission is to go into all the earth, you know, spread, spread out, cultivate this world, make something good of it, and continue to, to build it up, okay? That's, that's part of our, our mission. And yet, what we find in Genesis chapter 11,
and we have a group of people and they meet and they start building a city together and they build this tower in this city and this city eventually comes known as Babel. And their intent is really not good. Their intent is to meet God but on their own terms. Their intent is to really rise up to, to the heavens on their own terms. And you see that God says, okay, this people is unified, but not all unity is necessarily good. You can be unified for some evil things. And so he sees them unified for something very evil. And so as part of the result of this, God says, okay, if you're not getting out there and spreading out and, and cultivating this world as I've asked you to, I'm going to force it upon you in this case. And he does. There is a spreading out of people that happens and there is confusion and there are different languages that develop. Now, part of that is God's intention. Part of that, though, creates a lot of challenges for us. Because, again, it breaks down communication, right? You have different people that, that develop their own civilizations in different parts of the world. And if we don't speak the same language, it can definitely create some challenges. And so the rest of the Bible is really a story of how these different people groups that have been scattered around the world, how are they now going to interact with each other? How, how are they going to, to find peace? Or go, are they going to fight wars with each other. Sometimes it is peace. Sometimes it's peaceful trading and intermarriage. Sometimes it's war. Sometimes it's, it's one oppressing another when it becomes more powerful. Uh, so there's interaction between these groups throughout the rest of the Bible. And what we have are the development of nations and tribes of people even within a nation. Smaller groups of people even within that. And the development of nations is not all a bad thing. Uh, there's a lot of good that can come from that. However, there is also a sense that whenever people gather into tribes, people gather into nations, what often happens, the human tendency is, they start to isolate themselves from other nations, or at least they think themselves superior to other nations, or to other cultures, to other tribes. And so we have what we would call tribalism that develops. And here's something else that's ugly that comes along with tribalism often over time. These tribes not only start to develop their, their own you know, communities where they, they, they want to stick to themselves, we see that whenever they start confronting people that look different than them, speak a different language than them, there is resentment. There, is, there are feelings of superiority versus inferiority and, and there are, there's tension there. We've seen this throughout history. And this is what we would call a couple, throw out a couple terms here. And I think these, these are challenges for us. Don't dismiss these terms too easily. They've been struggles for mankind from the beginning. These are not just American problems. These are everyone's problems. And that is the idea of racism. The idea of racism is, is thinking either that your race is superior to another or at least that you, have, you make certain assumptions about another race that looks different than, than you. Uh, you. Maybe you stereotype them in certain ways. And even though you may not think yourself superior to them, you can still make assumptions about them that are unfair uh, to them. So that's how racism works. Now a cousin to racism is what we would call ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is this. It is the culture of your people, of your tribe, of, of, of who you're comfortable with, who you live with. That culture becomes something that's so centralized in your life that you start to think that that culture is superior to another person's culture. And sometimes these things work hand in hand and sometimes they go together. And so we see this developing and you really see this uh, in, in many ways developing even with the Israelites. Now not so from the beginning. What we read of in Genesis chapter 11, right after the Tower of Babel, it's, it's significant that you have all these different nations now, or at least the beginnings of these nations. And then the next chapter, after it tells us some generations that have followed, God chooses one particular person out of all these nations. And he calls him away from the nation where he has been living. He says, I'm going to take you on a journey. You're really going to be an immigrant. You're going to be a stranger that's going to move to a new land. I'm going to make a new nation of you. I'm going to create a name for you and your family is going to be very special. This is a guy by the name of Abram. He will later be known as Abraham. And God says something else to him. He says, not only am I going to make a nation for you, so you see the concept of nation is not all bad. A nation can be very good. And so, but he says, through your family, through your nation, through your seed ultimately, your descendants, or even more specifically, one of your descendants especially, all the families of the earth, 
all the tribes, all the nations, all the languages, all the people groups will be blessed. Right from the beginning you can see that yes, God is zooming in his focus, it seems, like one particular nation. But he is not just choosing them as superior to the rest of the groups in the world. He's saying, I am choosing you because I have a special purpose for you. Through you, I'm going to reach all the people of the world. And that's really the theme that plays out in the rest of the Bible, is the fact that God is trying to reach all these nations. Next time you, do, you read through the scriptures, and especially in the Old Testament, you look at the book of Psalms and you look in the prophets like Isaiah and these other ones, look for how many times God talks about the nations, going to all the nations. It's the same language that Jesus uses of the Great Commission, right? He says that he's sending you to all the nations. That's where the gospel's going. We've been singing mission songs tonight. Uh, that is part of our call of Christianity. But God is, is doing this through the family of Abraham and specifically one particular person who is coming in that family. Now, along the way, though, Israel, just like any nation, developed some problems. Too many, over time, you see those same tendencies creeping in. Tribalism, nationalism, racism, ethnocentrism, where they start becoming so focused on themselves and, and forgetting God's purpose of them being a light to the nations, of interacting with others. The poster boy for this, I think, is a prophet named Jonah. And yes, he's a prophet of God, and yet he is called to go to a foreign people, to a different culture, and a culture that he found very offensive. And there was a lot of evil that was going on in that culture. These are the Assyrian people, and they are really the political and the enemies of Israel at the time. Uh, they are in warfare back and forth with these people, and yet God says, Jonah, I want you to go to their capital city. I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach to them. I want you to offer them, tell them that... that there is a God. He demands your, their repentance or the city is going to be destroyed. And I want them to be saved from this destruction. And Jonah is very resistant to that, isn't he? He is reluctant to go. Why is that? It, it, if you read between the lines, it's not that Jonah is lazy, that he just doesn't want to go on a mission. It's these particular people. He doesn't think that they're worth saving. He thinks that they, these, good, if God's going to destroy the city, they should get what's coming to them. That's what he even wants after he's preached to them. He sets up a lawn chair on, the, on a hill looking over the city, and he's like, surely God's still going to destroy these people, and he's there to watch. It's almost like he's got the popcorn popped. I'm ready to watch the fireworks here. And it doesn't happen, and he's upset about it. What does Jonah reveal? Jonah reveals a, a, a focus so much on his own people being who he thinks are worthy being superior to others. And he's missed out on what God was trying to lead him to in reaching other people. You've got to think bigger, Jonah. This is, I think, God's message through him that Jonah largely misses. Let's not miss the same message. But the Israelites, for the most part, they missed it. By the time you get to Jesus, what do you have? You have a very splintered, and segregated society in the time of Jesus. You think about that. There's a lot of evidence of that in the scriptures themselves. You three, read through the New Testament and you see that, that in, a, in a time where the leadership of the Pharisees is kind of dominating people's thinking and the whole idea of being a Pharisee is to separate yourself from others. Now God does say that there are certain things that, are, that you need to be concerned about with the world around you. There are things that you need to to regard as pure and impure. The Pharisees, though, don't want any interaction with any other group. They, they want to be separate from them. And you see this playing out to where you see that, that when Jesus starts talking about Gentiles, these non-Jews being part of God's plan, a part of his mission, people are all offended about that. No, that's, no, that can't happen. We're the people of God. This is for us. And yet Jesus' vision is bigger it's bigger than just one nation, bigger than one people group. It's, it's to bring multiple people groups together. I think the segregation and the, the downright racism in the time is most pronounced with the typical attitude toward the Samaritans. Now the Samaritans are kind of sandwiched in between the, the Jews that live down in Judea and the ones that live up in Galilee. 
And the Jews kind of like it that way, where they've, they've kind of made that a no-fly zone almost. You, know, you, you guys stay over there, we'll stay over here. We won't interact with you, you don't interact with us. They look down on them. There is definitely an air of superiority, so much so that, that we, we read of Jesus shocking people by making a Samaritan the hero of one of his stories. When the Jewish leaders are the ones who pass by this guy who was in need on the side of the road, who was it that stopped and helped? Who proved to be a neighbor to him? It was the Samaritan. Samaritans were looked down on mostly because they were viewed as a mixed race, an impure people. They were, it is true that generations before, they, their origination was from intermarriage between Jews and between Gentiles that had happened in the time of whenever the Assyrians had taken some away and had displaced some and replaced others. And that's ultimately the group of people that arises. And the Jews say, no, they, they're, not, they're not the descendants of Abraham. They're not pure enough. Well, they better check out their own history. <laughs> they failed to check that out. You know, part of the genealogy of Jesus himself, you know, part of the point that is made in the Gospel of Matthew is this. Jesus, who is the ultimate child of Abraham, he is the seed through whom all the nations of the earth is going to be blessed. Guess what? His genealogy isn't purely Jewish either. There's a Canaanite in there, Rahab. There's, there's a Moabite in there, uh, Ruth. There are foreigners who are in that. There is intermarriage. There is no such thing as a pure race. Okay? And that's what a lot of them had missed. Even Jesus himself shows us that even the chosen one among the Jews had international blood in him. Uh, there's a place in Ezekiel where God even reminds his people, don't you know that your, your father was a, was a Hittite? Yeah, you, know, they, 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 these are, you have come from other peoples too. It's not that you are just in some way superior to them. This is something they had to fight. So much with the Samaritans that in Jesus' ministry in John chapter 4, whenever he comes to a village in Samaria, and he doesn't just go around it. He doesn't hold his nose and walk by and get through it as soon as he can. He comes to a well to get some water, and there is a woman who is a Samaritan who comes and gets some water. And you'll notice that the first thing is that she is shocked by is that he just, that he actually speaks to her. She's shocked by it, right? That someone who is a Jew would actually look a woman who was a Samaritan in the eye and talked to her. And the text says the reason is that is it was just assumed Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans. What is Jesus doing? He is breaking down a cultural barrier. He's going beyond what the norms of his society were. He's showing that I don't care who, what your background is, I don't care if there are differences between us and our heritage, I value you. And I value you just as much as my apostles over here. And that shocked people. Guess what else it did? It not only had an impact on that woman, it had an impact on the whole village of Samaritans. And she goes back and says, come and see this guy. And we see a lot of them believe in Jesus. They are introduced to this barrier-breaking gospel. And that's what we have in Jesus Christ. He, he's, he is revolutionary in this in his time period. And in many ways, he has compelled people to make similar moves today, even in how they interact with people. I want you to read with me from Ephesians chapter 2. I want you to see how the gospel tears down <laughs> barriers and how important that is to our understanding of Christianity. Ephesians chapter 2, I want to begin reading in verse 13, and I want you to see Jesus, and I want you to think of the cross, and I want you to think about how this can bring people together. How is the cross central to bringing people from different backgrounds together? The focus of this chapter is going to be on this divide between Jew and Gentile, and people that thought they could not mix, that they could not be together, and it had been that way for generations, and yet in Christ we start to see these people come together. We see Cornelius and his family as the first ones who were brought in. And yeah, that was offensive to a lot of people who thought that they had, they had the right religion. They had the right family inheritance. And God says, your salvation is not by uh, your heritage. Your salvation is because you know you're a sinner. You're submitting to Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, no matter what your background is. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, that's the key to Ephesians is what, what is available only in Christ Jesus. Here's one of the things. In Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, 
It's talking about Gentiles there, people who were formerly, you know, felt separated from the covenant of God. They, they may not have been part of the Abrahamic covenant, but it wasn't that God had given up on them or wasn't thinking of them. They were part of His plan all along. You who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He Himself is, what? Our peace. Okay, this is what we're talking about. Is, is having peace between people who were not. He made peace between both groups. And he made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. What is that? That's saying that, that this, this dividing wall that has been there between not only Jew and Gentile, but could be there between any people groups, Jesus tears it down. Let's read on, verse 14. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity, that is the tension between these groups in the past. And then, of course, verse 17 and, and 18, 19, he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And then the conclusion in verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. Okay? Those are words for how we might view people from other cultures. You are no longer strangers and aliens. You are not foreigners. That is not how we see you anymore. It is not us and them. But you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Did you catch how many times he focuses on their formerly being two, separated by a wall, and now there's one? Now, why is the cross central to that? Here's why I think it is. Here's what the cross shows us. You look at the cross, and we, we celebrate it when we share in the Lord's Supper, and we think on that scene at the cross. One of the things I like to do whenever I'm reflecting on the cross is to see myself at the foot of the cross and to even visualize, if I've actually been washed in the blood of Christ, to visualize how much I need that blood dripping on me for cleansing. Okay? And here's what the cross says to me. Every one of us, no matter what language you speak, no matter how much money is in your bank account, no matter what's your background, no matter how good or how bad you have been in your life, every one of us who is of an accountable age, we are all sinners and we stand on the same ground at the foot of the cross. That's what we all have in common, right? That's what the cross reminds us of. It doesn't matter if you're from a Jewish or Gentile background. You're a sinner. You, you need this. It doesn't matter what, what sins you've committed in your past or what sins you haven't committed. You're a sinner, and you need this. It doesn't matter about who you've been before and how you may, society may elevate you or how society may demean you. It doesn't matter. We're all the same. We need that same blood, same, same ground that we stand on at the foot of the cross. The cross breaks down barriers. It brings us together. And I don't care who you're talking with, and whatever their story is, whatever their background is, whatever their personal struggles have been, Jesus is the answer for them. And this is why Christianity, among all the religions of the world, Christianity historically has been one that has not just been focused in one part of the world, right? Yeah, I know that we have pockets of every religion in the world, in different corners of the world. But the, the center of the population of people who claim Christianity has moved to different places throughout history, right? It was in the Middle East to begin with. It uh, was in the, the uh, European world for a long time. It, it's been in North America for a long time. Today, I think most people would say the center of Christianity in the world, at least population-wise, is Africa and even nations like India. Why does Christianity appeal to so many different people regardless of their background it's because of this the cross brings us to the point what we all have in common as, as human beings we all need a savior and that's what we read of right here and that's what we, we see that really if you go on and you look at the rest of Ephesians what is it going to say it's going to say it is through this multicultural church 
people from different backgrounds who have no other reason to be together. But Christ brings them together. It is through that church, when the world sees that church, Ephesians is going to say, God is glorified in that church. And even the authorities in the world can see that there is something that this church has that the world can never have on its own. The world tries to break down these barriers, right? And we see some progress happening in certain ways. And then we look around and we see how far we still have to go. The church needs to be leading the way. And it, we have to. This, this is what it's about. In Christ, Galatians 3 verse 27 tells us this. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. Anything that you may have regarded as something that gave you a superior status to someone else, the cross throws it out the window. And it says, in Christ, you are all one. And you are all created in the image of God. And you all share the same value together. Read with me from Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. There's this passage here, and if you turn there in time, it's great. If you want, just listen to it. This is a picture of the kingdom of God, both now and in our future state, as really revelation in this part at least gives us a glimpse into even heaven and what's going on there in heaven. And here's, here's part of what is said there. There is a song that, that is sung in worship to Jesus, and it says this, to the, Jesus as the Lamb. It says, they sang a new song, and here's what they say. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and every tongue, that's language, and every people and every nation. Four different ways of expressing those divisions that we often see in the world throughout history. And guess what? Jesus has purchased people from every one of them to be together as one. And that's what it says. It says they've even been made, he's made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Now all these passages that we talked about so far, they sound great in theory, right? All right, and I hope that you see that. I hope you see that this is God's mission, okay? That this is, by the way, that language of every nation goes back to Abraham, right? Promise to Abraham that God through his seed is going to bless every family, every nation. Uh, we find out that that seed ultimately is talking about Jesus. The book of Galatians highlights that. It is through him that the gospels open up to everyone. The completion of the mission, that's the big story. And then that's why Jesus sends his apostles and really all of his disciples out into the nations. Make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. According to Matthew chapter 28. And so we see, see that. Now, it sounds great in theory. Is this kind of unity and diversity that we read of possible on this side of heaven? And this is where we're going to transition in some of the practical things I want to share with you. How do we make this vision a reality? At least, how, how, how do we, we work to encourage it even more in our churches? I want you to turn to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. I want to look at this passage, and then I want to share with you seven Seven principles uh, that I hope will, will help uh, help you as we try to grow as multicultural churches. Acts chapter 13, we are going to read of the, really, the church starting to really expand. It, it has moved from Jerusalem in its beginning, and then it's gone into the surrounding area of Judea, and then guess where else it went? It went to Samaria. All those Samaritans, they were looked down upon. The gospel spreads to there, and then Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses all the way to the ends of the earth. And you start to see it spread that way. In Acts chapter 13, we have a very significant city in the ancient world. This is one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. It is the city of Antioch in Syria, a place that is war-torn right now. Very messy situation. Dealt with a lot of that throughout their history there. This was a very important place. It still is in the world today. Antioch is one of those places that really is number one a very diverse city it's an international place it was a place people would come trading uh, from many different places so it reflects many different nations of people that live there and yet Antioch also becomes one of the centers one of the hubs of early Christianity it becomes a very important city read with me what's going on at Antioch beginning in verse 1 of Acts 13 now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers listen to five names 
and listen to something, see if you can find something about these five names of people that are involved in the church in Antioch. Barnabas, and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Saul being the Apostle Paul that we know of later on. Now, now read the rest of it here. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. The context here is they're preparing them for a missionary journey. It's going to be a very international journey. They're going to go into different places. Eventually, they're, they're hitting all kinds of different cultures around that Mediterranean world. So it is important that this group that gets together to make decisions on this, not only do we see them praying and fasting to make this decision, what else do you see here? You see five people specifically mentioned right here. Let me tell you something quick about each of these five people. Barnabas. Barnabas is from the island of Cyprus, we find in other parts of the scripture. Simeon. Simeon, what is highlighted here is the fact that he has dark skin. It means that he is probably from an African nation. Lucius is from Cyrene, that is in North Africa. It is another culture, different than Simeon's. Menaean, he is either someone of political influence or he could even be, some people speculate, part of the slave class in this time period, which is interesting. He's involved with the leadership of a church, uh, even though he may be in a far different position of, of socioeconomic status. And then you have Saul. Saul is from Tarsus. He's a very educated man from a cultural Greek city. Why do I point out this passage here? What do we have? Five very different people from five different places that bring five different perspectives. And guess what? They are not only worshiping together in the same church, they are involved in the leadership of that church, the decision-making of that church. This, Antioch, is one of the places we can look to as a vision of what God intends. As our communities become more diverse, and, and you know it's happening even in small-town America, our communities are increasingly becoming more diverse. How do we respond to that? One of the things we've got to do is not only to integrate people into the worship of the church, get them into the building, but over time, integrate them into the work, into the leadership, into the decision making. Make them feel just as much a part of the church as you yourself feel. And that's what's going on in Antioch. And that's part of why there is so much wisdom that is conveyed in this decision about who is going to go on this international mission. Let me share you, with you some practical ideas as we wind down here. Uh, seven things I want you to, to, to take note of. Number one is this. Just because a church looks diverse, uh, if you look at the church photo of the, of the church as a whole and you say, okay, it look, looks diverse, okay? We, we have a church on our website that has representation. You can look at that picture alone. You can say, okay, that's a diverse church. That does not automatically mean that you are a multicultural church as God intends. Okay, and here's what I mean by that. You've got to look a little closer. I'm asking us to look at ourselves and look at Christianity as a whole, how much work we still have to go. Too many of our churches have not broken free from the separate but equal mentality that was at work in American culture for so long. That is still a mentality that even if people don't realize it's there, it appears in many ways. I'm convinced that the majority of people, especially in the church, genuinely, I, I, they're, they're, they want diversity. Uh, they, they want to be an integrated church. Some just have not gone far enough to make that a reality. Um, they make no real effort to mix with people of different colors and backgrounds. Um, this, this idea that agreeing that we are all equal in the eyes of God, that we're all created in the image of God, I think most people in the world that have a knowledge of Christianity would see that. They would see what we're talking about today, okay? Acknowledge that. But how do we go beyond that? Because a lot of these churches, what you'll find is, they may look diverse in their photo as a whole, but you come in and you've got a section that looks all white and you've got a section that looks all black and you've got a section that looks Hispanic and you still see a lot of segregation in that group. And then you've also got too many places that still have a church that's predominantly white, a church that's predominantly black, 
and would agree on pretty much every doctrinal issue. And they're within a mile of each other. Okay, these are challenges. We still have a long ways to go to work through some of this. Separate but equal is not good enough. That is not Jesus' vision for what the church is to be in its diversity. By the way, you see this type of segregation going on in the Bible. You might remember there's one particular story where even an apostle is called out for this. There is a situation that Paul refers to in Galatians where there was a meal that was going on and it had, they had some Jewish Christians who were there and they had some Gentile Christians who were there. And what happened was the ones who were from a Jewish background started dividing and going over and sitting on one side of the room and just interacting with those people. And the ones from a Gentile background started going on and over and just interacting with those people. And even Peter was caught up in this and even Barnabas was caught up in this. And you might remember Paul says he had to confront another apostle about this because that's, that's, that's not good enough. Separate but equal is not good enough. That's not true integration. When you have times to share meals together, that's one of the, the things that we have to work on. We cannot just be separate but equal. A multicultural church is one that is working towards true integration of everyone together. Number two is this. All of us, and you may be offended by this statement, but hear me out. All of us have racial or cultural bias on some level, myself included. Okay? All of us do. I'm not calling you a racist. I am saying that all of us have some type of bias in some crevice of our heart. Okay? We need to acknowledge that. It may even be an unconscious bias. But my encouragement to each of us is to confront those. And if you don't even realize those yet, ask God to. Pray about that, for God to bring those to light in your heart and to bring redemption to those different areas of your heart, uh, to be open to seeing them and acknowledging them as wrong and moving forward past those. Number three is this. When different cultures interact and begin worshiping and serving God together, uh, sometimes they can find some differences in their understanding of living the Christian life. This is a challenge for us at Rockville. When you get people who come from, from so many different places, there are different emphases that people put on which parts of the Christian life are the most important in different areas. That's just the practical part of what we struggle with. And by the way, this was a struggle for the, the early church too. Jews and Gentiles coming from very different cultures. And it came to the point in the Bible, you read about a lot of these people from a Jewish background that said, okay, you guys that are coming in, you have to, you have to be circumcised, you have to keep the Sabbath every week, you have to observe these feasts. Uh, only then can you be a true Christian. And the church has to meet in Jerusalem. The, the apostles meet with the elders in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. And, and they meet about this and they discuss it. And they say, no, there are some things that are just cultural issues, cultural preferences, and are matters of liberty. And we have to acknowledge the difference between those issues and ones that are actually moral or ethical issues. So what do they do? They send a letter out and they say, okay, things like sexual immorality, that's a moral issue, that's an ethical issue, even though that may be part of your former culture. That's something that you as a follower of Christ can no longer participate in. That's important. But something like circumcision, that is now a cultural issue. It's one that God, that doesn't matter to God one way or the other. And the early church struggled with this, but guess what? They worked through it. They found a way to get along. So the, what I'm encouraging you with is this. We've got to recognize the difference between something that is just a cultural practice. You may not even like it, okay? It may be something that you don't like about the way someone dresses, the way they weigh their hair, something else that, that's going on with them, something that, that's part of their a routine that they go through, whatever it may be. Recognize the difference. Is it actually a biblical matter uh, of morality, something that God has addressed? Something that God has said something about directly, okay? Or that he's, he's giving us enough evidence to know this is a moral issue or is it something that is just cultural? 
We've got to know the difference between those. You cannot force your culture on other people. This is a huge problem in mission work when people go into places and for years people found that they've tried to go into places in Africa, in Asia, in South America and they would go in and they would say, we have to build a church building that looks just like a building that we had in the United States and we have to have it this way and we have to dress this way. You need to be wearing suits and ties whenever you come to worship and all of this. And so many of them found that people were not responding to that. This was so foreign to them. Why? Because these were cultural things. They were not things that mattered morally. Okay, we've got to make a distinction between those if you're going to be able to get along with other cultures. Along with that, fourth, let me offer you this. Some of you from your study of Scripture, there are going to be certain issues that you have concluded that are not sinful for you to practice. And then someone else is going to have looked at the same issue. And for them, at least, it is sinful. It violates their conscience. This happens when cultures interact with each other. Let me give you a quick example of this. Um, in my time at Rockville, I have realized this. People, this is one example of this. People that come from, uh, have grown up in a Latin American or a Caribbean country. Uh, most of those people, I know this is a general statement, but there is, there is generally a much greater aversion to anything associated with practicing Halloween from those cultures, people that have grown up in those cultures and are Christians. If they are Christians, they tip, people from those cultures typically abstain from anything associated with Halloween. Now, now for, in your mind, you may say, well, there's nothing wrong for me to dress up like a princess and share some candy. Okay, that's how you see it. What has their cultural experience taught them? They may be from a place where that particular day, that time of the year, they see what's prevalent in their culture of that being a time whenever occult practices of voodoo and santeria are practiced in full. Now that, that adds a prime time for that. And they associate that event with, that, with those type of practices. For them and their conscience, they need to stay away from anything that's associated with Halloween. Now, am I telling you that you cannot dress up and go get some candy? Not at all. What I'm telling you is this. Even if you don't think something is sinful, if you sense that it may be a violation of someone else's conscience that may come from a different culture, do not place a stumbling block before them. Be very careful about what you practice and promote around them. Don't push a Halloween event on them, okay, if you sense that. This is one example. This is one that came to my mind. There are so many of these. Recognize if someone has a, has a conviction, you know, that, that's not wrong. Let them have that conviction, okay? Uh, don't, don't violate their conscience by pushing something on them. Respect that. There may be a reason for that conviction because of something from their culture. What we would call this in the Bible is a meat sacrifice to idols issue. You can read about that more in the book of Romans and 1 Corinthians. Five, it is this. If you want healthy diversity, you've got to stretch your personality a little and stretch your comfort zone and even step out of it at times. Well, again, human tendency is to be more comfortable with your own blood family and to be more comfortable with people that look more like you people that have the same interests of you, come from a similar culture to you, speak the same language as you, even sometimes the same accent as you. We've got to be willing to stretch that a little bit. Again, get to know people, hear their stories, interact with them, step out of your comfort zone, go out of your way to not only to talk with someone, eat with someone, now share some, some time together, not just worship, sit next to the pew, sit in the pews with someone that is, looks different than you, may even speak a different language than you. It will go a long ways. Six, quickly, what about language barrier? This is one of the biggest challenges of diversity, and we could probably do a whole lesson on this. Um, I'm sorry we don't have more time to spend on it. This was the curse of Babel, right? The fact that we speak different languages, communication is difficult. It's a difficulty for me. I'm not fluent in Spanish. We, we have uh, services that meet simultaneously, English, Spanish, and Korean. I, I, here's some things that I have found to help with that. First off, just learning a few words and phrases goes a tremendous way. I'm not saying that, that I'm prepared to preach a sermon in Spanish. I'm not, okay? 
but just knowing a few words and phrases, what does it do? Even just a greeting in another language, it goes a long ways to show that I value you, I value your culture, I'm willing to learn from you, I affirm that I love you. Learning some of those things like, hello, good morning, God bless you. Learning those in, in another language that someone may speak. Just those phrases, they go a tremendous amount of way. Here's something else I found. Food is a universal language. Okay, it is. Um, you don't have to speak the same language verbally to enjoy food together. When you have an opportunity to eat together as a church, don't do what Paul uh, saw going on with the Jews and the Gentiles, the people from different backgrounds, just separating and eating in their own groups. Even if you don't necessarily speak the same language, mix together, interact with each other, share food. It's a sign of I value you. I'm spending time in fellowship with you when you're sharing food with someone. And I'll say this, love is also a language that doesn't always need words to convey. Don't underestimate the power of a hug, of a handshake, of a smile, of just looking someone in the eye, of joining with them, standing next to them on, on the same service project, setting up a table or taking down chairs with them, right next to them. Okay, You don't have to speak the same language to communicate that. Just there's so much that is said just in that. My last encouragement to you this evening, you've been very patient and I appreciate that. No matter what differences exist between you and someone else, remember what you share. And what you ultimately share is Jesus Christ. If you've been baptized into Christ, Jesus describes it as becoming a branch on a vine. He is the vine, you are the branches. I'm a branch. I've got brothers and sisters around the world tonight that I may have not even met yet, but they are fellow branches on the same vine. That is what we share in common. We all stand on the same ground at the foot of the cross. We all share the need for Jesus Christ. And if you are in Christ, these are your brothers and they are your sisters. Value them. And even however different you may perceive where they're coming from, where you're coming from, the book of Acts chapter 4 uses a phrase for the early Christians as different as they were. It says they had all things in common because they had Jesus Christ in common. And then everything else is small potatoes. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for giving us this vision of what you have seen for, for your church throughout all the nations. And may we be a part of it. Uh, may Father, we pray that you would reveal to us any biases that we may still have, uh, that you would give us the courage to step out of our comfort zones, that you would help us to make more of an effort to involve others uh, who may already be a part of the churches that we're involved in or who may not be yet in, in evangelistic efforts. Father, we, we look forward to, to heaven where we know that it's going to be every tribe and every tongue standing around the throne singing praises to you. And we pray that that vision will become a reality in your kingdom right now. And we pray that you would use each of us in that. Bless this congregation here with growth and become more like Jesus in all that they do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, uh, my encouragement to you, we're going to sing a song of invitation. And if you have been struggling with this issue tonight, uh, any biases that may still be in your life, or if you just want to recommit yourself to doing more evangelistically, developing friendships, reaching out to people, like getting to know people. Or if you're not sure that you are a Christian, the Bible talks about we become a Christian when we respond to the gospel by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, by turning from that path of sin. And again, standing at the foot of the cross, realizing I need this blood. I don't want to live in my sins anymore. I want to walk forward with my my Jesus who has saved me. We come in contact with him by confessing him and by being baptized into him by faith in the working of God so that we can walk with him in newness of life. Tonight, if you have any needs, please come as together we stand and as we sing.